Awesome. Tim Price, welcome to the Relevate podcast. I'm so excited to be here, Renee. Thank you. It's Rena, actually. Rena. <laughs> Hit record. Let's redo it. Let's read it. Tim Price, welcome to the Relevate podcast. It is such an honor to be here, Rena. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, well, I just, I feel like we know each other because uh, as long as I've been connected in addiction and recovery world, the name Tim Price has always been part of that. And you are just such a beacon of hope and are doing such great work. So I'm so glad to have this chance to be here with you. And so more people can learn about your story. And um, you're just such a great leader and, and are really using your life to make such a difference. So thank you. Are you are sweet. Thank you. I do not take those words for granted. Those are very sweet. Thank you. Very good. So if you had one word to describe yourself, what would that word be? Uh, overcomer. O overcomer. It's, you know, there's been a lot of challenges, as you know, um, with addiction at a young age, uh, facing that, facing some dysfunction in the home, uh, being able to win there, you know, win in recovery and obtain long-term sobriety. The Lord has constantly reminded me through the 15 years of sobriety that I'm an overcomer. So whatever comes my way, whether physically, whether professionally, uh, whether with our family, I am reminded that, you know, if, if I can win in overcoming addiction, I can win in the home. You know, I can win in the workplace. I can win uh, with, with my health. I can win with my family. I can win with my friends. So. Yeah, that's such a good word. So I um, I've recently started asking this question on the top end of the podcast, and my last guest, that was the word that she used as well, That's Judge Katherine Schrader uh, from Gwinnett County. I mean, she is an overcomer, so yeah. I love that that spirit is resonating with my guest on Relevate, so thank you for, for being an overcomer. So let's talk about your younger years and how you found yourself. Um, you really came from a good family, from what I understand, but you found yourself addicted. So if you could share more about that story, Pastor Tim. Yeah, so we had a good family. I grew up in the church and I pretty much had everything that you would want as a kid. You know, great, great parents, um, great grandparents. We were all very close. Uh, we actually owned about 60 acres. Uh, so I had like go-karts, you know, I had everything the kid would dream to have, you know, and it was, it was really good. And I'll tell you where it really was hard for me is, is my identity. Um, even though I had all of these things and even though I loved sports, I was very active, I was connected, I was somewhat popular, you know, in school, I, I, I did not know who I was. And so I think I found myself when you get to that fork in the road and you start having to take ownership and responsibility as an adult, I found myself not really knowing who I was. Um, I had accomplished a lot. Um, I had been raised in church. There was a leadership gap in the church that I grew up in, which really uh, turned me away from the church. Um, so I, I can tell you, I really had closed my heart off to a lot of the believers that I knew and grew up with based off of what I thought a believer was, and then based off what I was seeing. So it, it, was, it was an identity issue. Um, I went looking for who I was, and I looked hard, and I looked in the wrong places. And I got my worth from a lot of the wrong places, which ended up not knowing I had a, an addictive personality, but found out the hard way um, that I would find myself addicted to cocaine and alcohol and pretty much any chemical that I could put in my body. Yeah. And it was, so how uh, old were you when this was going on? Uh, I was probably about 16, you know, when I first started using uh, in high school. And your parents, were they aware of what was going on? No, uh, it started to be exposed in my behavior at home. You know, it started to be noticed, but out of the gate, they did not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so then what? What happened? So I, I really started uh, enjoying escaping, you know, not knowing who I was and the lack of identity. So I increased the use um, where it started as a weekend thing, you know, uh, dabbling, drinking and out, having a good time, what I thought was a good time, going to being addicted and using harder drugs on a day-to-day -day basis until I hit my 
And what did that rock bottom look like for you? That was passing out behind the wheel of an automobile at 21 years old. So I had, I was in my addiction for about three to four years and uh, I had graduated Reinhardt College. So I was still managing somewhat getting through college, and working a job. But at the end of the day, I passed out right in front of my parents' house, hit a tree head on at 40 miles an hour. The airbags had took off the outside of my eyes, like pinning the skin off of a grape. Uh, it imploded in my face and I was unconscious on the scene. And the first person on the scene was my grandfather. Um, and the second person on the scene was my mom. And the third person on the scene was my sister, which totally breaks my heart because she was five years younger than me. And she couldn't even have people over to our home because of how disruptive my behavior and addiction had become. Wow. But nobody else was hurt, right? That's correct. So I woke up in the emergency room at the hospital. There was four people in the room. There was a pastor at the time where I went to church, my father, my grandmother, and a girlfriend. The first two questions I asked were, where did I wreck at? Because I was, I, was I was in a blackout. I had no idea what happened. Um, and the second one was, did I hurt anybody? Because I knew I could not live with that. I could live with the consequences and the jail time. And that's what brought me to no longer. Live. I spent 20 months residentially in a recovery program, working on my heart, rebuilding my life, but I could not live with hurting somebody. So, um, so did you go willingly to no longer bound? I mean, did you realize that this was your chance or were you, were you really ready to do the work at that point? I was court ordered. I was mandated. If I left no longer bound at any point during the tenure there, um, I would have to go serve time. Two years is what the court was asking. Um, so I, I was forced to go. And, and there was a part of me that wanted to go. You know, I, I wanted, I mean, I, what turned me around was when I got home from the hospital that day, my brother, which was two years older than me, walked in the room and I could see it in his eyes that he had lost hope in me. He, he had lost hope that I was going to change. And that broken relationship, my family cutting me off to say, listen, we love you, but we're not going to tolerate it anymore. That actually motivated me to want to go. Now, when I got there, that was a whole nother thing, as you probably are aware of but I was motivated to behavior mod modificate, you know? I was motivated to show that I was willing. And I think for so many people who struggle, you know, it takes something like that a lot of times for them to just really realize how serious the problem is mm -hmm. and that you're not just hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a whole family who loved you, whose hearts were broken watching your behavior. So thank God you found yourself there. T tell us what happened once you got there and how you really found hope and healing from your addiction. So I jumped into the program and, you know, you can't con a con. You hear that in recovery. You know, the first thing I had was an interview with two guys that had been through the program. So they could read me like a book. I'd never had that with my parents. I never had that with a coach. Um, I never had that with a leader in my life. And so when somebody was talking to me that had been where I had been, my ears started to open up a little bit more. So when they were speaking truth and love, I realized that they had a good point and I probably should start listening. Like the first thing they told me was you're, you're really prideful. You're, you're really prideful. And that stung, you know, and then they asked me how I, you know, how I loved my parents. And I didn't have a really good answer. You know, how, they asked me, how, how are you showing your parents that you love them? And it just, it humbled me because I, I couldn't answer that question because everything I had been doing would, would be uh, verbally abusing, you know, saying things that hurt, you know, we would fight in the home. So 
it, it opened my eyes the very first day I got on property. And as the program went on, I continued to open my eyes. Well, and for people that don't know about No Longer Bound, a residential treatment center means you are there night and day. There are no visitors coming in and out with the exception of family on the weekend. Um, your environment is very controlled. Your schedule is very controlled. And it's all about helping you heal. You're in classes, you're working. I mean, it's just such a fantastic program. Mm -hmm. So um, 22 months, so when you were there, did, what, what did you think your life plan was going to be? Did, uh, thought to enter ministry, did that start to bubble up at that time? No, I mean, during the program, I thought about going back and playing sports in college. I mean, th those were the thoughts. Like, I was getting healthier. I was starting to look physically healthy. Um, my family was being reconciled. So the dream and the vision hadn't been revealed quite yet. It was more of restoration, reconciliation. Um, but one day in particular, I had a, an awakening experience, an inner healing. It's like one of the, the main courses in the program. It's about eight, seven or eight months into the program. And the Lord really showed up. He showed me and revealed why I use chemicals, like why I was acting crazy. He, he actually showed me. And then he showed me where he was in that process that he was in the room the entire time when I was hurting, when I was, when it was just me and a bottle of alcohol, or it was me and uh, a mirror with cocaine. And I was, I thought I was completely alone. And the only relationship I had was with that bottle or that drug. He showed me that he was right there with me. I had just completely closed off. And when I saw that he never left me, I realized that he really cared. He, he really loved me. And so I started to be like, if he loved me through all of that and he never left my side and he still loves me and he's willing to walk with me through this forgiveness process, then I want to serve him. You know, I, I want to give back. I want to help others that are lost find hope, you know? And so I told him, I said, you know, God, I'll do whatever you want. Um, I was 22, yep. and uh, if you want me to be a missionary, I'll do that. If you want me to launch churches, I'll do that. If you want me to serve you at No Longer Bound or in Earth Free, I'll do that. Very cool. And I think another thing No Longer Bound affords people by putting you to work in various um, various roles. It's super cool that we were both director of marketing there at one Mm -hmm. um, but you kind of discover what you're good at. So when you were there, what did you discover? Like, what were some of your strengths you discovered? Well, I would, I found out that I was a leader mm -hmm. um, pretty quickly. You kind of, as you gather trust and gain trust in the program, they start to elevate you in certain roles and give you more trust. So I found myself as the youngest guy in the program leading the house with all of the other residents. Yeah. And, and, and I found the Lord speaking to me, you know, like Paul told Timothy in the word of God that, you know, set an example in your age, like with your words, with your actions. So at a young age, I started to take ownership of my leadership. And I'll tell you too, even before I got to no longer bound, I was, I was a leader. I was just leading people down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. <laughs> so you knew you had that in you already, but uh, when you got sober, it started to develop. That's so cool. Okay, so let's talk about, I know journaling, journaling is a big part of the healing at No Longer Bound. Uh, do you still do that practice? And, and talk to us about how that helps you kind of stay connected with God. Every day I journal, and it's been very consistent over the last 15 years. It's been the one thing that I have not deviated from when it comes to habits and schedules. Um, the reason I do it is because we naturally go to what we're lacking. It's just normal to do that. I found in the recovery program that journaling allowed me to set my focus and target for the day. Mm -hmm. So I do that every single morning. The, it's the second thing I do. The first thing is I hit, 
I hit the Keurig, I get the coffee, and, and then I march over to my office and I pull out the Word of God in my journal. And I, there's two things I do. One is I always try to ask God a question. Uh, the second thing I do is I identify my belief system. I make sure that every day that I'm not deviating from the core beliefs that gave me my sobriety. The things that I learned about the Word of God that were ingrained in my heart that have allowed me to grow, develop, to lead others, to have more opportunity. So I just make sure that I'm not shifting any type of beliefs. So I write them down. I write down my top 10 beliefs every single morning. Uh, I'll do a gratitude list every morning and then I'll, I'll just turn on and talk to God. That is so powerful. And um, I, I journal occasionally, but I'm, it's one of those things that's on my heart that I really can see the potential of how it, it really can provide focus and clarity and um, what a great way to start the day. And then you have that written history of your life and what was going on in your heart. I mean, what a legacy that'll be for your son and your family, mm-hmm. you know, for them to really see what was happening in your heart mm-hmm. and your mm-hmm. words to God. Mm-hmm. Super cool. And you don't use any type of fancy journal. It's just a notebook, right? And some paper. Correct. And a quiet spot and mm-hmm. a Bible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I would encourage y'all all to, to think about doing that because I think whether you're in recovery or not, that would be an amazing practice. So, um, you mentioned the Holy Spirit speaking to you at No Longer Bound. So, how, how does that happen kind of an on an ongoing basis for people who aren't really in tune with how God might be talking to them? What's that like for you, Tim? So, I would be a naturalist. I connect with God in nature. Um, I'm a big believer in stillness. So, in the morning before Noah, I a 13 month old before Noah or Carrie are normally up it's quiet it's still so I'm really just listening I'm engaging with God and I'm asking a question in the journal and allowing the Holy Spirit just to speak to me of course he speaks to the leaders and mentors in my life and I allow the Holy Spirit to have a voice there but I would say if, I, if, if there was a bottom line of one thing uh, it would be stillness it would be I love taking walks in the park. And I really don't try to think, I really don't try to engage with God. I just allow myself to connect with my, my the deep part of myself. So things will come up I need to deal with and, and things that the Lord is, is showing me. So it really is just making time in my day for a quiet time. But then also in the afternoon, if I can get some time to walk uh, in the neighborhood or go to a local park, I'll just walk and, and just process, you know, and if God starts speaking, you know, I normally will pull out my notes. So how do you know know that God is speaking to you? So he lives in me. One thing I learned really quick at no longer bound was of course journaling. And the fact that if you have received God as your Lord and savior, his dwelling place is your heart. That, that is his turf. And so if I can remove the distractions in life, the busyness, you know, the, 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 you know, the, this, the season we're in has been a great season to reconnect. It's been one of the opportunities Absolutely. Uh, yeah. because so many things have been shut down that we've been home. With. But for me, it's, it's knowing that he does possess my heart. That's where he dwells. And so if I can remove those distractions, like, Oh my gosh, what do I need? Or the business of work, or just the things that I haven't done with that I've kind of pushed down, things that have been done to me, maybe things that I have done that I need to circle around and, and communicate on. I'll just allow all of that to get out of the way. And I know in my heart that I'm hearing from the Lord because one, He's in me, but two, I've removed all distraction, I've gotten still. And so I know when there's a clear line of communication between my head and my heart. And, and there is a level of faith. There there is a level of faith to that. I don't get it right every time, of course, but I believe I hear from the Lord. I believe that anybody can hear from the Lord. You know, I know believers that have said, I just don't know if I'm hearing from God. 
And I just remind them that he lives in you. And it does take managing a schedule where you're engaging and you are healthy enough to hear him. So many times we go to God and we're just like, God, I've got this. I need your help. And there's a place for crying out, but we can't hear God when we're talking. So I think it's, it's being healthy enough that every time you do go to connect in a silent place, that you're not, that you're not just hurt, hurting so much that you're not able to just listen, you know? Right. And you've talked about the distractions and we, you know, the phone, music, people, I mean, they're just, we're living in just, we're oversaturated with stimulation and um, yeah, it's hard to get, it's hard to get quiet. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people aren't comfortable when it's quiet. You know, it's like, I got to have the music on. And I think that's such great advice for us to pursue quiet more. Mm -hmm. So we can hear God's voice. It definitely feels unproductive. And sometimes God will ask you to do something that you don't want to do. You know, and he'll be like, oh, you need to have that conversation with your wife. Or, you know, you need to talk to your boss about this. And that normally can require confrontation. Um, because, you know, God wants us to be healthy, but there's a lot of fear in rejection. There's a lot of fear in hurting others. And, and if we learn to be honest but respectful in what God is calling us to do, we'll learn to be more clear on hearing from him because we've been obedient to what he's been asking. Right. And that, for me personally, being around a lot of people in recovery, the thing that I need to work on is being more relational and being more bold in um, addressing hurts, <laughs> you know, and um, people in recovery are just the best at that, at being vulnerable and sharing from the heart. And I think, you know, people not in recovery can definitely learn from that because I just, you know, you crack through the surface and you, you engage in a deeper level of relationship with people, which is amazing, you know, mm -hmm. when you, you just can't be fearful of it. And if somebody walks away because they can't handle it, they walk away. But, you know, we are called to be in relationship with each other, not the superficial stuff. So I love my peeps in recovery to this. They challenge me in that area, make me better. So how did you find your way um, to becoming a pastor? I'd, I don't know that part of your story. Well, I, uh, once I got the revelation of how much God loved them, dear and no longer bound, I, I started to pursue ministry. I started uh, connecting in recovery ministry because that's what I knew. I'd been through the 20 months. I got healed. And so I worked for seven years in recovery ministry. I worked for no longer bound for three. And then I worked for three dimensional life, which is a teenage recovery program for boys. And so I did that. I loved it. And then I started to kind of realize that I wanted to be on the prevention end. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of inner healing. There's a lot of deep hurt in recovery. And I taught inner healing for years. And so I was like, you know, what would it be like to help people, you know, in preventing them from getting to addiction or rock bottom, helping families and leading people. And so I uh, found my way to Free Chapel. I've been a pastor there for seven years. Um, and, and it was just kind of like, I felt like the recovery side had, had taken a transition. I felt like it was time for me to move on. And so I've been doing that. And uh, two years ago, almost, I planted a I'm sorry. So did they have a recovery ministry already? At Free Chapel? Uh -huh. um, we partner with recovery ministries, mm -hmm. so we, but we do not provide a recovery program, if that makes sense. Yeah, but you were over that part, right? When you were at Free Chapel, how did? I did help manage the connection, but I was hired as a, a simulation pastor and a young adult pastor. I got you. So, yeah. um, but you kept you kept a toe in the the recovery part of it. Of course. Okay. And that was it. Awesome. So tell me about Free Chapel coming. 
So I lived in Cumming, I mean, longer boundaries in Five County. And so i had been around the area for a while and our church at Free Chapel was growing. So Pastor Jensen is our senior pastor. I'm the lead pastor for the Forsyth location. And he just asked, hey, would you be willing to plant a church in the Forsyth area? And of course I'm like, yes, that's where I live at. Um, oh my gosh. And so 16 months ago today, we mm. went into Denmark High School where we launched a church on, on the opening day. We had like a thousand people show up, which was really powerful. And, uh, and God has just been faithful. The, the, the whole process of restoring me and allowing me to give what I've learned over the years to give back and to serve the community. And I'm just honored to do it. I really am. Yeah, so I have watched that church and it just looks so dynamic. And I know it, it has to have been difficult going through COVID and having services temporarily suspended. So how have you stayed engaged with your people during this time? For, well, for me, church was never a building. I learned so much at No Longer Bound about relationships and community it's such a brotherhood they you know they teach you accountability and how to speak truth and how to receive truth so i felt like you know i was a perfect candidate to lead in this season because for me it's uh it's about people you know and even though we have a building we have a great worship experience we have great leadership for me it was always about discipling people so in this season, that hasn't really changed. Um, of course, we don't meet on Sundays. We still meet virtually. We still have online lunch. We're still interacting with uh, people in small groups. So for me, it's like discipling, just like Jesus did, modeling that, having the 12, investing in them, teaching leadership, and creating a regeneration pipeline within the church, and just making sure that people are being cared for um, people that are elderly, of course, we're making phone calls, you know, people that are vulnerable to COVID. We've had to take a different strategy there, but God has been faithful. And I believe that things will be greater once we exit completely uh, all of the phases of COVID. And I'm just honored to do it, really am. For those, I mean, I, I probably miss being in church more than anything throughout this whole quarantine thing. It's just, um, it just nurtures my heart and, and keeps me grounded and keeps me filled up. So being the leader of a church, I know it's got to be so hard to just be like, come on people, we're, we're going to get there. And you've been amazing on social media, keeping people encouraged. Thank you so much. That's well, not easy to, to deliver those messages of hope on a pretty much a daily basis, right? It is, it is, um, you know, I, I believe leadership is, is about vision and vision comes from God. You know, the, the word says without a vision that people perish. So for me, I've just really tried to turn up my connection with God, even though it's always been good in this season, you know, I've been increasing that connection so that people have a leader. I believe in the church, there's a leadership gap, you know, that's the whole reason or one of the big reasons that I found myself dabbling in drugs as a teenager is because I, I couldn't find uh, an environment or a space where I was being uh, formed, where I was being discipled. And that's not to say that, that, you know, there's a lot of great churches doing really awesome. I just feel a burden for, for me to help close that gap, you know, to help in this season provide leadership, to help provide vision to help people transform because ultimately that's what being a believer is, is regeneration. Yes. You know, it's, it's going from one stage to the next as God continues to mold you and, and build you and grow you. So it's on, I'm on. And somewhere along the way, Christians have kind of gotten a reputation for being perfect. Mm -hmm. And most of us are, we know we are anything, but, you know, we are broken and, you know, we are seeking um, knowledge and understanding and love from the only one who was perfect. So I really love that about you is that you wear your recovery with pride and your history 
And, <laughs> and, you know, so many people just, you know, they, they want it to be in the rear view mirror. They don't want to talk about it at all. And everybody's different. I totally respect that. But I love the bright shining symbol of hope that you are out there, you know, saying, Hey, I would, you know, I struggled once, but I got better. And, um, God loves you. He hadn't left you. And that's just so powerful that you're doing that, Tim. Well, I'll tell you, I learned that vulnerability is what helped bring me to sobriety. And I never want to lose it. You know, I never want to stop being transparent. I don't, you know, if, if it turns some people away, and I understand it could, you know, because it's maybe too much or, or somebody's not really ready to walk, walk in that or, or look at that. But uh, for me, it's been, it's been the way out of a very dark place is being completely open. So that's one of those things that I don't deviate from. It's one of the beliefs that transparency creates intimacy. You know, we all need more intimacy, you know, with God and with each other. Yes. Yeah, totally. And um, the church uh, pre-chapel coming has come out of the gate, <clears throat> really reaching out to the nonprofits in the area and the connection, the addiction recovery support center that's there. So thank you for doing that. Of course. And, and because we're stronger when we come alongside each other, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. So I hear from people that you are very much a praying pastor. What, what does that look like? And why do you think a, pr a prayer life is so important? Well, I figured out at No Longer Bound that it wasn't a physical battle, even though the word says that spiritual training is more valuable than physical. Mm -hmm. I always got my acceptance through physically performing whether in sports or, you know, just, just, you know, striving, right, for perfection and leaving a little or no room for God. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to reverse that. I wanted to get all of my acceptance and connection in just a little from the physical side because the physical side left me confused. It left me with the wrong identity. It left me striving to get acceptance in areas that were not serving me well. And so I just turned up the prayer life and I really needed Jesus. Like I had no option. I mean, if, if I turned away from my recovery and didn't learn how to pray and didn't learn how to humble myself in prayer and asking others for help and crying out to God for my own sanctification, um, I never would have made it. I never would have made it out. So it's just another one of those beliefs, you know, that I don't deviate from. Like, even though it could cost me something, you know, as far as influence with other people, or people may say, well, he's weak. Well, that's, that's on you. You know what I'm saying? I get my authority and power from God, and I'm going to stay right there. Yeah. So we have a, a mutual friend who goes to your church, and I was asking him about what kind of leader is Pastor Tim. And the one word he said is, he is a leader who listens. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so powerful. Because a lot of us don't listen, because we think we have the answers. And especially being a pastor, people look to you for answers. So for you to kind of turn that upside down and be like, no, I'm gonna be a leader who listens. Why do you think, where does that come from, Tim? I'm going to give my wife credit for some of that. She, you know, but they say, and by no means, I feel like I have a long way to do it. But they always say there's a strong woman behind every great leader, you know, male leader. And, uh, and she's just a great listener, you know, and I want to be more like that. And so it's easy on a Sunday or when you're leading hundreds of people, it's easy to have a lot of, uh, Qual a lot of quantity touches, but not a lot of quality, yeah. you know, because you're just like passing people in the hallway. There's tons of people that are calling or whatnot. And I've just found out, you know what? I just want to hear people. I just want to know, you know, how they're doing. And by all means, my wife has really influenced me in that. She is incredible and compliments me in that. So I feel like maybe that was a compliment and, and I'm still working on seeing that in me, but I certainly 
think that that's awesome that somebody said that for sure. Very cool. So what would you say is your biggest challenge as a pastor? That is a great question. I think, I think it is, you know, I think it's focusing on, on people. You know, I said that that was a strong area because of no longer bound, but as you grow in your influence and as you find yourself like at one level to another, um, leading people in, in having the right people under you and around you, so important. So I, I think it is, it's, it's discipling and it's replicating uh, people around me that can help serve and, and, and lead others versus trying to do too much. So that probably is the challenge right there, trying to do too much, trying to help too many people. And then I find myself sometimes coming up with like, you know what I mean? You're just like, oh my gosh, do I have anything left? Uh, so it's, it's just really focusing on people and making sure I have the right people around me um, so that we can continue to be effective in our side and you know, in the church and around the community. That's so good. So what would you say to someone who really is um, not a believer and hasn't given faith a chance? What would you say to that person? Well, for I've tried it. So, uh, you know, I have money, uh, materialism, uh, you know, relationships that were unhealthy, drugs, alcohol. Uh, so I tried everything before I tried the spirituality. Um, so I know it works, you know, and one of, one of the big quotes that really impacted me is you can live your whole life the way that you want, living by your feelings and get to the end and realize there's a heaven and a hell. Or you can live your life healthy and make great choices and follow God and get to the end and realize there isn't a heaven or hell, but to live a good life and realize there isn't, you haven't lost anything, but to live however you want and get to the end of your life and realize that you were wrong. Um, that really impacted me to say, you know what, God, I'm not just going to have knowledge, but I'm going to let your word take root in my heart. I'm going to really follow you because if I live my life and I was wrong, you know, look at all the impact I've had. You know, even though I know that I know that I know that it is real because I've seen it and I've experienced him, that was the turning point, you know, because if I lived my whole life based off my feelings and going and chasing things that really had no lasting value, and I got to the end of my life and realized that I missed it, that would cost me everything. So, so Jesus works, you know, I know he does and I believe in it, but I had to try everything else. And I think it was just getting past like connecting with somebody that I couldn't see, you know, that I felt like couldn't understand. Um, I wanted, I wanted like physical evidence, but when you find yourself lost with nothing and you put everything into trying to quit on your own chemicals, and you still can, you know, that's where I was like, you know what, this is the one thing I haven't tried. I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot. And I think um, there's a lot of people out there who, for whatever re reason, they might have had a bad church experience or they just don't, you know, they, they don't like the way that many Christians portray themselves. They've just never given faith a chance. But you know, if you're feeling this gaping hole in your heart that life has no meaning, you know, I think that's, you need to give it a chance, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you have to lose? Just to be open to cracking that door open to your heart, to, to exploring the possibility, you know, you don't have to, and it's, it's a lifelong journey. And that's, that's the thing I love about being a follower, follower of Jesus. It's just, it just keeps getting better and better and you learn more and you get stronger and stronger. It's mm -hmm. not a, it's not a flip the switch and done. Right. It just makes you better, makes mm -hmm. you better at life. Mm -hmm. So ready to get back in church. <laughs> I know. I know. It's going to be crazy that first night we're all back. I know. I know. We're excited. So. Okay. So um, we're hurting as a nation. 
uh, really, really grieving. Uh, this past week has been just so, um, so troubling for all of us as it relates to racism and race relations in America. Do you have any words of hope or encouragement for us on that, Tim? I would say listening is so important. You know, listening, we have a very diverse church and uh, a lot of my, my friend tours, like the people that I'm closest to, you know, are, are uh, African American or are, are different, you know, racist. And so for me, I've had a lot of conversations. I've had them in my home. We've, we've like recently and just talked through and listened to perspectives and you would have no idea of what other people have went through, you know, and you never, you never quite can have the answer. So I, I think it is facilitating environments where you can have those type of conversations, where you can listen. And by listening, you, you can get revelation on your own DNA and your thoughts on, on the subject. So for me, I, I learned a ton just this past Sunday having breakfast with a few families over at my house and then realized, oh, wait, I don't, I don't understand that you know, or, or I came from a totally different background. So, I, and I never saw that in you before. So I do think it is listening. Um, so that we can go first, you know, that there is a leadership gap in the faith community, in my opinion. And, and we have to, we can't just share scriptures. We can't just inspire, but we have to stand with, you know, and we have to walk with in this season. So we are one body and we serve one Lord, you know, and I believe that. Um, but it's not enough just to say that. It's not enough just to post that on Instagram. You know, what, what matters is what I do with my time. It is, it's how I show that, is what action supports that. Um, because when there is no action, there's a reaction. You know, and a lot of people, that's how they love. Mm -hmm. You know, is receive love, is, is by action. So... I think it's important for us as a church and believers to not just know the thing you know the answer, but to listen and then to show that too. Right. And I um I don't know. I to me, I, I don't want to have a conversation on social media, you know, and for me, I mean I'm a peace, love, and harmony harmony person. So to see our nation so divided, I mean it is gut-wrenching for me as a person. So I'm just kind of quiet in prayer right now trying to figure it out. And I would just hope that, you know, my brothers and sisters of color would know that just because, you know, because there's a call for white people to speak up, just because we're not being vocal on social media doesn't mean that we are not sharing in your pain. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and we're just all, we're all different and we're all processing it. But you know, I'm hopeful that this is moving us forward and is, you know, we are the United States of America. We have got to find more common ground and in the words of Jesus, love each other better. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Love people, love God. Mm -hmm. right? I think it's John Maxwell, but he says people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. There you have it. That's so true. So true. Okay, one more final question for you. So the word relevate means to uplift or restore to good spirits. In closing, Pastor Tim, what other words would you like to share with my listeners? Well, in this season, for me, it's the Lord has been speaking, hey, it's time to rebuild. You know, all that we've been through with COVID, all that we're going through right now in our nation. And so you rebuild by hitting refresh. And I, I love it because hitting refresh for me is like when you go to your browser and you're just kind of hitting the refresh. If you're waiting on an email, you know, your pages is, is, is like uploading, uploading. I, I think for us, we need to take time, you know, change of pace versus change of place equals change of perspective. So I think we need to hit refresh um, in this season um, as a nation, as believers, non-believers, so that God can restore because when we're hitting refresh and we're leading ourselves, then God is able to restore. And that's exactly what happened to me. It no longer bound when he restored me. He reconciled my family. I was hitting refresh. I was gaining perspective. I was listening. I was learning. 
And uh, to hit refresh means to re-energize. So a lot like the podcast. So I, I think that's key. I think we do need to have um, time to think. You know, we need to have time for us in this season so that we can gain perspective, so that we can hear, be still and hear God. And, uh, and then we can approach with love. Uh, that's key to approach with love so that people see our heart. People see that we're available, we're reachable, and we're teachable um, as leaders. So I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity just to talk with you. I love your heart. I think you're doing amazing things. And I'm going to continue to support and pray for this. Thank you so much. You are a gift to this community and are such a bright light out there sharing the, um, the word of God and just being a, a man that we can truly look up to and respect. And we can learn so much from the way you lead and listen and pray. And um, you're amazing husband and father too, no doubt. We really didn't get a chance to, to dig into that, but that's all good stuff. Pastor Tim, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Okay. Talk soon. Awesome. Thank you again.